So it's a pleasure to have uh, with us today uh, Adam Boros uh, to tell you briefly about his life. Uh, he got his uh, PhD at MIT. Uh, he was then a research uh, associate at uh, the University of Michigan, then Stony Group, then became an assistant professor. He continued and then moved to Arizona and finally Princeton, where he is now. He has worked on uh, lots of different topics including uh, supernovae, loma stars, uh, planet evolution, neutron stars, between astronomy, X-ray astronomy, and some, some others. And he's going to tell us today about uh, some mechanisms, new insights in that corporate supernovae. Thank you very much. Can people hear me? People in the back hear me? OK, great, thanks. What I'm going to do is try to summarize where I think we are in the, the modeling of uh, core collapse supernova explosions. I will say at the outset that there is no definitive model that has emerged to convince everyone that we understand what's going on. So having said that, I will say that I think there's been a lot of progress in understanding the basic dynamics. There are various themes that are emerging. And those themes generally involve multidimensional hydrodynamics and multidimensional effects, particularly instabilities of various sorts. And so I hope that at least that emerges as, as the, the major um, message of this talk. But there are a number of different mechanisms that are competing, and I'm going to talk about each one of them. I'm also going to talk about our general goals. And of course, in doing this, I've been collaborating with a number of people and have some support, hopefully ongoing support, from uh, various institutions. And perhaps this will work. Yeah, there we go. This is just a summary of uh, the basics of uh, these types of simulations. These things are not spherical. There are significant instabilities. Um, there's possible MHD effects, 3D effects, general relativistic effects, bipolar jets. And these are just summaries of some of the things that we've been exploring to try to get a handle on what's going on. The basic uh, goals are, the important questions we want to address are summarized here. This is, of course, not uh, exhaustive, but it, it is a, a pretty good list. We want to understand the mechanism of explosion. That's the most important uh, goal. It's true that neutron stars are the fastest population in the galaxy. They're going at, on average, about 400 kilometers a second. Some are going at 1,500 kilometers per second. They seem to be given those velocities at birth, associated with the explosion. We'd like to be able to demonstrate we understand that. Of course, core collapse supernovae are the seed of nucleosynthesis of various sorts, not just the uh, iron peak, but the R process and uh, intermediate mass elements like calcium and silicon and sulfur and argon that are produced not just in core collapse, of course, but in type 1a supernovae, but I'm going to be talking about the deaths of massive stars here. We want to understand the blast morphology. When these things explode, again, they don't explode as spheres. There's indications in the data that that's the case by polarization, by measurements of the um, debris morphology, etc. At a minimum, we know that they're not spherical, but exactly how to explain what we're seeing is not clear either. We'd like to understand the origin of pulsar spins. Um, it's possible that you start out with a certain uh, angular velocity distribution in the core of a massive star. We don't understand that either, but then you have to map that into the collapse and the bounce, etc., and to see what the final spins are, where that spin could be changed by torques, gravitational torques, MHD torques, a number of different processes. So that's one of the things we want to understand. But of course, in the same context, we understand the origin of magnetic fields. Neutron stars have perennially high magnetic fields, um, but there are magnetars that, have field, that are fields that, of course, uh, two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude higher. We'd like to understand the context for, these, uh, for the formation of these fields, because it's not going to be just flux freezing where you take the flux, the magnetic flux of the white dwarf that collapses and compress it to neutron star densities and expect to be able to explain things. Certainly not magnetar fields. We want to understand the origin of not just neutron stars, but black holes. There are probably a, a million stellar mass black holes in the galaxy. Maybe 10 to the 8 neutron stars in the galaxy. Maybe 10 to the 9 white dwarfs. They're all stellar corpses. But a million black holes is still something of interest. And we see a number of black hole systems. How are they formed? What stars give black holes? We want to understand the systematics of progenitors, of course, with progenitor. As the mass changes, um, what, uh, how does the supernova energy change? How do all these other things change? We don't know that. And something that's new is the connection with gamma ray bursts and so-called hypernovae. 
it seems as though there are explosions that explode with 10 to 52 ergs, not the canonical 10 to 51 ergs, or close to that. And then there are gamma ray bursts that seem to, to uh, be birthed in the context of massive star death. But which massive stars? Maybe the most massive stars, and maybe with black hole formation, again, connecting to this. And so there's now a large theory that is evolving, or should soon evolve, that it combines gamma ray bursts and supernovae, the origin of the elements, pulsars, etc. Now that's a large program, and we'll see how we do. Of course, the standard paradigm is the, the onion skin structure of massive stars, where you have progressively heavier element shells as you move into the center. That center for a star more massive than eight solar masses um, <coughs> evolves to the so-called Chandrasekhar mass. It's a cold object at low entropy that is supported by electron degeneracy pressure, reaches the critical condition, and it collapses. It collapses after evolving for 10 million years, up to that point, within a half a second, to nuclear densities from white dwarf densities. When it achieves nuclear densities, it rebounds. The inner material rebounds into the outer material, and you have a spherical piston. The piston drives a shock wave out, which, because shocks involve entropy generation, is, in, uh, is an indication that that expansion is being dissipated, and that shock should be the supernova moving out, driven by this initial bounce, but it isn't. At least in all the simulations that make any sense, that shock generally stalls. And the subject uh, over the last 20 years or more um, has been focused on, the people who have been working have been focusing on how to revive that shock. But what you have is a stalled shock with matter accreting in, and neutrinos, which come into their own in this subject, radiating out of the central object at very high luminosities. And the, uh, most people think that it's these neutrinos that heat the material that has been shocked behind, uh, behind the shock, um, that heats the uh, material behind the shock on time scales of maybe hundreds of milliseconds um, that, is the agent, that are the agents of explosion. That may be true, but there are other possible mechanisms as well, and I'm going to try to summarize them. Whatever the mechanism, the explosion, has, um, the explosion mechanisms all have similar um, characteristics. And it's that theme that I want to explore. Uh, this is the same sort of thing with the onion skin structure with a couple of numbers here where you might start out with something the size of the Earth that collapses in a quarter of a second to a half a second, leaving behind a proto-neutron star which is on the order of 30 to 100 kilometers in radius, and that's where all the action is. That's much smaller than the entire star, which doesn't collapse in. It's just this inner core. That star may be between 10 and uh, 400 solar radii. So it's only the inner engine, uh, the very, very central region that uh, has all the energy. Now, this is a, uh, an example of the density profiles. Um, this is at 10 to the 10 grams per cubic centimeter, 10 to the 2 grams per cubic centimeter versus central uh, interior mass, that's the center, one solar mass interior, etc. These are different progenitor models. And the point of this is to say, well, in the interior, the structures look all the same. That's the Chandrasekhar core. But in the exterior, the density profiles can be very different depending on whether the progenitor is very a, a very low mass massive star, like an eight solar mass or nine solar mass star, or a 25 or a 35 solar mass star. For the latter, you have a shallow density gradient and a lot of mass at, at, at intermediate radii. For the former, you have a steep drop-off in density. And we have to be able to explode all these objects. And so you can see the variation in the outer profiles, which affect this stable stage when you're just looking at the shock because matter is raining in from this outer region onto the inner core. If we have to explode all these types of objects, that it can't be a matter of just the details because we're varying by orders of magnitude in these densities. It's not going to be a matter of just this neutrino process or that neutrino process that we might have forgotten. It's a pretty robust mechanism. Um, the details will make a difference when details make a difference, but not when we're talking about the mechanism. Why and do you think they all explode? Uh, a majority of them have to explode. We have to explode the more massive ones for nucleosynthesis. We have to explode the less massive ones because they dominate the rate. And you see that neutron star birth rates, uh, pulsar birth rates, O star death rates, supernova remnant birth rates, supernova rates are all within factors of one another. They're all sort of close. They don't, we could miss a few, but why? 
Okay. So some of the comparison questions that I'm going to try to address in this talk are, what's the difference between 1D, 2D, and 3D? What's the difference between rotating and non-rotating? What's the difference between including magnetic fields of note and not including them? What's the difference between doing a full multi-angle Boltzmann solution and doing so-called multi-group flux limited diffusion? And then what's the difference between various mechanisms, the neutrino mechanism which people f prefer, the MHD mechanism which can happen with rapid rotation, and this controversial acoustic mechanism that seems to happen if nothing else happens, um, but maybe is under energetic. Now this is a movie of 87A, the supernova that went off more than 20 years ago. The point of showing this, and this is this ring here, this is HST pictures over the years, is that you can see the morphology of the blast in the inner region, and it's not spherical. And every time you have a chance to look at the inside, whether it's by polarization or line profiles or imaging, um, you always see that, the thing, uh, that it's basically aspherical. It seems to be fundamental in all these things. And this is just another example. This is uh, Chandra X-ray pictures uh, with uh, element distributions of sulfur, for example. But these colors are different element distributions, and they're not spherically distributed. And many of these elements are associated with the explosion itself. It's going to be possible, and this is just an advertisement for the New Star X-ray uh, satellite to actually say something about this. Here's Cass A. It's the case that it's probably the case that in Cass A you produce radioactive species. Nickel 56, certainly. That's decayed away by and large. But what hasn't decayed away is the titanium 44. And titanium 44 has lines that are at 68 and 78 keV, which are going to be sent for which, um, to which uh, the new star satellite is going to be sensitive. It's going to have energy resolution and spatial resolution. And so we should be able to see Doppler shifts of titanium distributions and see, whether, and see the images of the distributions. And so we'll be able to see whether we get very asymmetrical explosions, and that's the key to this. There is an indication as well of asymmetry in polarization data, and this is just an example. This is visual brightness versus days since the explosion for this black curve. This is polarization versus days since the explosion. That's the right, red curve. And the point of this uh, plot is to indicate something interesting. This is the light curve variation. And there's obviously a, a change that goes on right here. This is a change to being semi-transparent and supported by nickel decay or cobalt decay. And you're starting to see, when you, this happens, you're starting to see in the optical deep inside the object. At the same time, the polarization jumped. Polarization indicates asphericity. And so we can't really model this very well because it's a very difficult thing to do multidimensional uh, calculations with polarization. But we know that the jump of the polarization indicates when we're seeing into the interior that we're seeing something that's very aspherical, more so than the exterior. Another indication that we have to do multidimensional <coughs> work. Now this is a mess, don't worry about the details. Let me just very quickly go through some of the things. Remember I said there was this bounce, you don't even need to have to look at that, look at me. Well, <laughs> don't look at me. Look over here. Um, you get this bounce, a shock wave is formed. That shock wave, people thought for a number of years, was the supernova, but it stalls. That's the direct mechanism. It just about always fails. You can also ask the question, well, if it fails and you have neutrino heating behind the shock, remember all those neutrinos coming out, maybe that can revitalize the shock at reasonable time scales. That almost always fails. The best neutrino transport put in these calculations, there are only a few groups doing this, indicate that the shock still sort of sits there. Except in a uh, small set, almost a set of measure zero, the, the less massive, the, most, uh, l the lightest massive stars, maybe 8.8, 8.5 solar masses, with those steep density drop-offs. But every time you have that steep density drop-off, remember that those plots of density profiles, the energy of the explosion is 10 times too low. They may be very under-energetic, but a lot of them are energetic and have 1051 ergs, not 10 to 50 ergs. So those things have to be pretty rare and, and, and not so common. It's possible that the shock wave sits there and becomes unstable. And we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And that seems to be an important key. But the so-called standing accretion shock instability hasn't been shown to, with reasonable physics, to actually lead to explosions um, that are energetic. And I'll talk a little bit about that. 
there's this controversial uh, mechanism, the acoustic mechanism, which we've discovered uh, in principle can obtain at later times if nothing else happens. But there are some caveats there. I will show some interesting movies, though. You can easily get the neutrino-driven explosion to work in the accretion-induced collapse of a white dwarf. If you have a companion white dwarf to a donor star and you accrete up to the Chandrasekhar mass, there's nothing in the way. And the explosion occurs quite nicely. If it's rotating fast, you get bipolar neutrino-driven explosions. And we get that sort of thing. But those are always also under-energetic. And we don't know how many of these things there are. How many neutron stars are formed by accretion-induced collapse? There may be very few or none. MHD explosions are, are certainly possible, but generally only if you have rapid rotation to, to tap the differential kinetic energy. We don't think that these things are born rotating fast enough by a long shot with kinetic energies that are probably 100 times off. But maybe sometimes they are rotating fast enough. We don't know exactly when. And those may be hypernovae. But the key to all the mechanisms that are viable for most of these things is the breaking of spherical symmetry. Okay. Uh, there are many issues and problems. There are wonderful codes uh, that are being applied to this. This is just a, a description of some of the things in our code. People are interested in this. I can talk about it later. It has MHD, rotation, multi-angle. Most of the calculations are multi-group flux limit diffusion, Poisson gravity solver. But it doesn't solve the full 3D problem. So let me start with the neutrino wind-driven explosions, the, under, the low energy explosions that you can get for the low mass massive stars in the accretion-induced collapse. This is just a low mass massive star, 8.8 .8 solar masses. There's the shock wave right there. And you can see it's going to repeat. And you can see it blows up quite easily. It blows up basically spherically. There's no rotation in this calculation. These are velocity vectors. It's already gotten out to about 3,000 kilometers. It's going to get out further, of course. But if you calculate this, this is again, this bounce, the shock wave. It stalls for a little while. There's the clock down there. Within 90 milliseconds after bounce, it explodes. This is satisfying up to a point. You get a neutrino-driven explosion. It came out of the calculations. We didn't do anything. We just put in the best physics we could, but the density profile on the outside was so small, there's no tamp holding it in. And a wind just emerges because it's unstable to a neutrino-driven wind. I can explain that later if you need to. Um, yeah. So what is the big difference between an 8.8 .8 solar mass progenitor? You're saying it's the lack of stuff on top of it. Yeah. But um, if you have a big wind, but that only feeds down uh, in, you know, where you essentially break down into a helium unit, but uh, that's not what you're talking about. The generic supernova probably doesn't look like this at all. But I am, I am talking about... Um, I'm just wondering... Uh, if you what have it is that makes the difference between a 12 solar mass and an 8 solar mass? It's, it's the tamp. When you have a lot of accretion coming in, it just keeps the, the pressure around the neutron star is too large. And if you don't have any accretion at all, and you just have a, a neutron star, a proneutron star sitting there, you can do look at the atmosphere okay, with neutrino heated, and you can show that the atmosphere is unstable to a wind. And so uh, you it's the tamp that, that stops it. You believe that those calculations are precise enough so that we actually do know the details of I mean, For the wind, the yeah. calculations are detailed, but it's not the wind so much. It's the, uh, uh, the uh, pre-supernova structure, which is what counts for this. If the pre-supernova, yeah, if the pre-supernova structure is, does have that steep density drop off, I think this is a reasonable outcome. We don't know whether the progenitors are correct and whether okay. any of the and progenitors actually do this, but that's what people have been... There's in. no controversy about no, no, the, the, the trend goes in that direction. Whether it's that steep, I think, is an open question. But with steepness such as we've inherited from the modelers of the progenitor evolution, then we can get things like this. So does it matter They're always under energetic. That is electron capture rather than an iron core which uh, collapses? Or that, that doesn't make any difference uh, dynamically. Energetics is just in the... Yeah, in yeah, yeah. The inner region, the dynamics doesn't make much difference what it's made of. Um, I will say again that if you have a neutron star sitting there, because of neutrino heating, you can show just like a Parker wind solution for the solar wind, that you get a very shallow temperature gradient because of neutrino heating and cooling's equilibrium. And you can show that you can't get hydrostatic equilibrium without a finite pressure at infinity. So if you don't have those pressures, it's spontaneously unstable to a wind. It's because of all those ta that tamp uh, of the accretion from that outer material that you don't get this most of the time. And in fact, that tamp is what keeps the thing from exploding generally in the first place. Now, this is the generic case. 
where the previous calculation was actually done in 2D. This is two, done in 2D as well. You have matter falling in. There's the stalled shock. This radius is 200 kilometers from here to here. You have all sorts of convective motion, etc. It's very, uh, it's rather violent. Um, this is the inner proto-neutron star. But you see that that shock is, 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 is inhibited in, uh, in emerging by the tamp of the material falling in. If you didn't have this infall, you'd have an explosion pretty easily. You wouldn't necessarily have an energetic enough explosion. Anyway, just to repeat. And you can see after sitting around for a while, the shock becomes unstable. And people have identified this instability as the standing accretion shock instability. There is an instability to the shock. Um, uh, and Fernandez and Thompson here have uh, done a nice job of diagnosing some of this. But there's also neutrino-driven convection. And the two together conspire to give you quite a vigorous oscillation. And so it's unstable to this oscillation. And this may be part of the key of the explosion mechanism. This is just the beginning. So what is the essence of the neutrino mechanism? Um, here's a heating profile for a 1D calculation where you have a stalled shock and then this is uh, the, number of, the amount of energy deposited is positive above the zero, negative below the zero. And you have interior to the shock, you have this so-called gain region where you have positive energy deposition. Then interior to that, you have a cooling region and then you have the neutrino sphere. So the structure that's established is a stalled accretion shock, classical accretion shock. Then you have a heating region and a cooling region. If you didn't have the cooling region, you just had heating, you could get these things to explode pretty easily. If you didn't have the accretion at all, these explode pretty easily. It's because we have to deal with what we think is nature. Um, and, and you can't get around these various regimes, including the accretion, that we have the problem. But this is the 1D distributions. If this were higher and this were lower, you might be able to get it to work. But you put in all the best physics and you play around with it. You change the cross-sections by factors of two and three. It doesn't make any difference. There are lots of feedbacks in this problem. So this is the basic thing. You have a stalled shock, accretion, and neutrino losses. This is maybe 30 kilometer, 50 kilometer. This is maybe 150 kilometers. In this gain region, you have, again, net heating. But you also have heating from below. And that heating from below gives you, drives convection, just like boiling water in a stove. The complication is you have invective flow through the shock that complicates the condition for the instability, but might lead to the um, uh, standing accretion shock instability, which we see even when we don't have the neutrinos in there. Okay? And then you have this cooling region as well. So, in 1D, what you have is a comparison of the invective time where you have a, you've matter comes in, hits the shock, and then can't move to the side, just goes through the gain region, goes through the cooling region too quickly. In 2D, in principle, the um, material can swirl around in this region and it can stay in the gain region longer, increasing the efficiency for neutrino energy deposition. We haven't done the 3D calculations yet. But in principle, there's another degree of freedom. And so what we're comparing is the characteristic heating time, which doesn't depend on all these gyrations, to the advection time th through this heating region. And the hypothesis is that the time scale for advection increases as you go up in dimension, from 1D to 2D to 3D. I will say in 1D, the calculations indicate things just don't work too often. In 2D, they're marginal. And then when they do explode, it's because you change the equation of state a little bit too much, or um, they explode very under-energetically. It's thought that in 3D you're going to overcome all these problems, and that's the working hypothesis, at least of our group. Okay? That's why it's taken so long to solve the problem, because we haven't been able to get to 3D and do a reasonable job. We didn't think we'd have to get there. Now, this is just an indication of what I mean. These are Lagrangian uh, test particles coming in, you can see this shock bouncing around a lot with the standing accretion shock instability. Lots of convection in here. Very, very vigorous. Still not exploding. But when these uh, particles come in, they encounter this shock and all this roiling motion, and their trajectories are distorted. And you can see we, it stays further out longer, further out longer. And so it's that sort of thing that we expect to see, and to see in spades in 3D. So the neutrino mechanism still has a life. It still may be the mechanism by which these things explode. And it may be because, again, that you increase the efficiency with the three-dimensional turbulence. 
even though it may be quasi-spherical. The Lagrangian mass motions are not. So let, let's go back to that for a second. If we can. Um, so in that trajectory, um, if I do an absolutely neighboring trajectory, does it begin to diverge? Yeah, yeah, it's part? chaotic flow, even so, in our simulation, which okay. is under resolved. So, um, what is the, uh, how are you making the grids? Oh, you know, that's a whole subject in itself. I'm sure it is. The, uh, the group. Just use the keyword. <laughs> there isn't a keyword because it's unique. Um, we're using uh, a Cartesian grid in the center that transitions through topological defects to spherical grid further out. And so we have a spherical grid on the outside, and we don't have the spherical convergence of, of a cylindrical grid or a uh, spherical grid in the inside to get around the current condition. So we don't have the current problems in the center, and it's basically a Cartesian in the center. And that also allows us to do the in, very inner regions in 2D, in multi-D. Everybody else who's doing these calculations is using spherical grids, and they have the current problem in the angular direction. And uh, therefore, they do the inner regions in 1D. And it's just the radius at which they make that transition, and the radius they frequently use is 20 kilometers or something like this. So what was the word you just said you used? A topological defect. A topological, what does that mean? Well, you have to it's like combing, it's like combing the sphere. No, I mean in terms of actually coding. What point to me? I may have a diagram later in the uh, just, that shows. Can can't you just sketch it on this where your topological defects are? Uh, sort of over here. So you have little defects in making a transition from a Cartesian grid to a spherical grid. Right, and uh, you have these sorts of things in in, in, so you're making in cube spheres as well. Adaptive in that boundary region. Arbitrarily. Adaptive and. We, this code is adaptive, but we're not doing that. We're keeping it fixed for these calculations. All right. So how many dynamical times does that stage last before the whole thing turns into a black hole? Black holes? I didn't what, what say anything about it? black holes. No, I mean, it, it, it doesn't explode. Something else must happen if you keep running it. it. If it doesn't explode, how long will it stay there before something bad happens? Something bad? Some people like black holes. <laughs> oh, black holes. <laughs> um, it's about a thousand dynamical times. A thousand dynamical times. Yeah. We do about a million time steps. So we accumulate errors. So there are a million cycles in these calculations on that order. About 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 19 cycles of calculation. Floating point operations. Sorry. And at the end of those thousand nanometer times, the thing is not going anywhere close to explosion. And if you added up the mass, it would You're trying to summarize too much too soon. Uh, no. <laughs> let, let me continue. I'll show you some of the other stuff. OK. So the basics are the following. If you have a large accretion rate, you have a tamp holding it in. If the luminosity is low and the accretion rate is large, you don't explode. However, there's a critical luminosity above which you do explode. And we've demonstrated that recently and in earlier papers. And you get a critical curve of neutrino luminosity versus m dot, below which there are stable solutions and above which there's no stable solution. And it, it makes the transition to an explosion. In nature, it sort of follows a trajectory that is below this critical curve for 1D simulations. In 2D and 3D, the actual luminosity m dot profile or, or trajectory doesn't change much, 1D to 2D to 3D. However, if you change the dimensionality, you can show that the critical curve actually moves down. And I'll and so I'll talk about that. So you, in 1D, the critical curve is above the actual trajectory followed by nature. In 2D, it's near, unsatisfyingly so. In 3D, it goes below, we think. And we think that's the key to the explosion. OK. And this is what I mean. This is a paper done by uh, Jeremiah Murphy and myself. It's published recently in AppJ. Here's the critical curve, the luminosity. We're trying to understand the neutrino mechanism. If you have enough of neutrino luminosity, you can do it. Does nature provide that? It doesn't seem to do it in 1D. But the critical curve is a function of dimension as I tried to argue before. Hence, in 1D, you get a critical curve like this. In 2D, you get a critical curve like this. And so you need 30% less luminosity in order to explode in 2D than in 1D. In 3D, we don't know where it is, and that's where we're going next. Nature is making the trajectory follow this. I should have put that on here. Uh, L, L luminosity versus M dot. Too close to the 2D to be that satisfactory, because we don't want it to be dependent on too many details. And so that's the idea. These cr the actual trajectory in nature follows some curve. 1D is above, 2D is near, 3D is explosive. To what okay. degree are 
M dot depends completely on the progenitor. But L depends partly on M dot. It does. It does. It does. Because there's accretion luminosity as well as diffusion luminosity. But for any particular calculation, even a 1D calculation, um, by and large, you can use a 1D calculation before it explodes. You can actually see what the tra trajectory is. And you can do it in 2D, too, or 3D, eventually. And uh, by and large, it, it doesn't depend on the dimension. There's a little bit of noise, but not a lot. Um, there's one thing to point out in multi-D. Um, in 1D, you have uh, the shock material. The material settles in, and you have a certain entropy that's achieved by the post-shock material. Entropy is a useful quantity. People don't use it enough. But if you have high entropy atmospheres, those atmospheres can be unstable and they can blow off. If you take a star and you add entropy to it, the temperature may go down, but the radius goes up. And so it tends to expand things. And in this, this is no different. This is the entropy profile, the red curve in 1D. And for the same calculation, these are the entropy profiles in 2D where you have a whole range of entropies, including a lot of material at high entropies. And if you have enough material at high entropies, sort of all in the same direction, you can get it to explode out in that direction and break the symmetry. Uh, this is all I have to say on 3D. Okay. So very quickly, I want to also say what the um, dependence is on the scheme. There aren't any other schemes in the supernova game that actually do multi-angle, multi-group. This is energy group. Uh, time-dependent transport in 2D. So this is the only results. The multi-angle means we're doing, we're basically solving the Boltzmann equation. But that means that it's also highly computationally intensive. These things took six months. One run took six months on, on the NERSC supercomputers. But we wanted to make a comparison between the simple uh, approach where we have multi-group but uh, flux-limited flux, limited flux uh, uh, diffusion and multi-angle. And so here's the grid that we're using. This is the Cartesian in the center, spherical on the outside, and a transitional region here. And those are the topological defects. If people are familiar with a cube sphere approach, then this is fairly similar in 2D. And so this is just the scheme that's being used. We use the so-called SN method for solving this. It's not perfect, but it, uh, if you have enough angles, it's, it does give you the right solution. And the thing I want to call your attention to is if you have a regular calculation, here's the heating profiles, here's the stall shock. This is with a multi-group flux limited diffusion. The red dots, the red spots are hot spots. Uh, and you compare it to the SN multi-angle, there's not much difference. This is a non-rotating model. When you don't have rotation, you don't have these extremes. That you have, if you do have rotation, which makes, gives you an oblate object. And the transport along the poles and the equator is very different. And so you can see we don't have the red dot, the, 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 red, the, the symmetry here that we have over here, over here, where this is a rapidly rotating object, just taken at a certain time. And so what we get is when you include rotation and you include the multi-angle stuff, the multi-angle effects are important. And this is important only for the people who were worried about details. It didn't make a difference in the explosion. But when it does explode, this will be an effect if it's rotating fast. OK. That was technical stuff. Now, let me talk a little bit about some physics. And this is work done in collaboration with Luc Dessart. You saw that proto-neutron star left behind. There's a lot of shaking going on. It was suggested that the inner region was unstable enough to uh, convection, doubly diffusive instabilities, salt finger instabilities not just simple convection, that it would dredge up heat to the neutrino spheres and boost that neutrino luminosity. Remember I said higher luminosity, all else being equal, gives you explosions. Well, Wilson has suggested that you get these instabilities right under the neutrino sphere, and you can dredge up heat. Makes perfect sense. And so we try to simulate that. And so this is a simulation of exactly that, using the same basic approaches. There's a shock. It's outside here. What you should see in here is that there's an instability that does develop. But between this region and the outer regions here, there is a quasi-quiescent region. It may be getting a little bit roiled here. But by and large, there's an instability region here. There are G modes that are over here, which are quiescent. This is stably stratified. And then there's instability. In other words, this mixing here does not join with the outer region to dredge up heat where it's needed. 
you expect that to change when you go to 3D? I mean, because this is... I'll, I'll keep theory. an open mind. I mean, it would seem to me that that's the arena. Where's the neutrinosphere? The neutrinosphere is out here. It's trying to get its energy out, and it'll choose the right. path it has, and that will probably be a short distance. There may be, you know, nature will find a way. You know, it's a Jurassic Park. Um, it's true that when you have another channel um, that uh, for instability that nature can find it or will find it to lower the energy or lower the free, uh, free energy of the final state. Um, but um, this is pretty deep. Anyway, my point is the following. This is not a doubly diffusive instability. This is a regular convective instability driven by negative lepton gradients, just like mean molecular weight gradients in stars. And the doubly diffusive instability isn't there. Okay, so it, it's sort of cute to see these things. We can actually simulate the double diffusive instability with our 2D radiation hydro. You do get an instability, but it doesn't boost up the luminosities and didn't make a difference. Pity. Now we get to accretion-induced collapse where we can see explosions, but in our models of accretion-induced collapse, you accrete matter, but you also accrete angular momentum. And so it spins up the object. And so we get a fairly oblate object. It looks like this. It's rotating so fast that it looks like a lozenge of some sort. It collapses along the poles and almost immediately explodes. This is the proto-accretion disk, which is the star, the side of the star in the equatorial region. These are isodensity contours, and it's colored by entropy. It's going to be messy to, in the beginning, but it's going to clear out. So don't worry about the, the, the graphics too much. But notice, it exploded along the poles. The bounce actually stalled a little bit, then it was driven by neutrinos. But now you see a wind emerging along the poles. That's that blue. That's a neutrino-driven bipolar flux. So you get neutrino-driven jets, reasonably collimated. It's wide angle, but it's a collimated uh, uh, bipolar neutrino-driven jets that are the explosion. And here's the clock right here. This is after about three quarters of a second. These are the structures. So you have this cold star. You have the hot jet, high entropy jet. And there's the proto-neutron star, which is rotating very fast and is very oblate. The oblateness makes the neutrino spheres uh, on the pole hotter than on the equator. And we can calculate that. Did you have full equation of state on here? Oh, yeah. Including, uh, and so how are uh, neutrino losses done? What do you mean? It's, 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 it's full well, transport. Well, this is the full transport code. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and you know it's, it's accurate for its 2D. Accurate. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, we've done it a little bit higher resolution. What, what's in the calculation is um, what we think is a realistic initial model for, uh, for uh, the increasing induced collapse progenitor from Yoon and Langer. We take the rotational profile, which is a little bit dicey, but we just take that and we just collapse it. We just let it evolve. It includes electron capture. It includes neutrino matter interactions of all sorts, emissivity, scattering, absorption. It has multi-angle, um, well, one of the calculations is multi-angle. This is actually flux limited. Oh, okay, so, so maybe, um, and this is multi can you play this again and just show me where the neutrino sphere is here? I have another slide. Okay, great. As this is, what, is, what is this? This is an accretion induced collapse of an iron white dwarf, or what are we looking at? Yeah, it's any white dwarf. In the, yeah. It's so accretion induced collapse. Well, it didn't have to be. It was actually near magnesium. But if it's a. But the burning it, doesn't matter. The burning doesn't matter. It's a star which, which cannot explode by nuclear burning. So no. anything which is heavy no, 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 enough no. that it doesn't Yeah, oxygen near magnesium is too bound, and there's too little energy in burning it up. Uh, the effect is very small. Did you check the gravitational stability of that? Yeah, 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 it's marginal. Yeah, yeah, the T over W is about 0 0.08. And we did it for, uh, and you notice the mass of the thing. Uh, I'll show you. Mass, 1.92 solar masses. That's because of rotational support. Uh, we, we did it for 1.46 too with a different profile, etc. So generically, it looks pretty good. This is the same thing. The vectors are velocity vectors. The rotation is due to the rotation of the camera. It's a purely Hollywood effect. Okay. But you get the blast along the poles, and then these are isodensity contours, and these are Keplerian motions of the inner material. Okay. This is, these are trajectories of some of the matter elements. 
that's again an affectation, but the, the, those are blobs that have followed these trajectories and they're bent over because of the mass, the gravitation in the disk. But this is just a snapshot and the shock is over here. And the stuff is just basically, uh, this, this eventually becomes, goes on ballistic trajectories. This just shows what it looks like. Now you can do the same thing with magnetic fields. Again, we have 2D plus rotation. You'd like to have 3D, but 2D plus rotation allows three, three um, um, directions for the magnetic field. It's just that the phi component of the magnetic field is the same in all phi angles, but it's non-zero. Okay? And this is a little, little simpler uh, movie. Same sort of thing, and we're just focusing on the inner region. Shock wave moves out, and then there's this blast. And this blast is driven by a magnetic tower because this thing was rotating so fast you actually spun up the magnetic field and the magnetic stresses were large. And here's that jet coming off. The thing, reason I want to show this, one of the reasons I want to show this is you get flow, uh, uh, you know, not just along here but out this direction and you get Kelvin Helmholtz rolls here and you get eddy digging. And so you start eroding the inner accretion disk from this more energetic MHD driven explosion. It was driven by a combination of neutrinos and magnetic fields. Um, on this scale, yeah. where's the R process? I don't think the R process happens here. It's much further out or not for this? <sighs> That's one of the constraints on the rate with which these sorts of things exactly. can happen. Exactly. And uh, these things can't happen too often and be consistent with the R process. Right. So the R process stuff would be in here yeah. and be ejected. And the R process... is huge. Yeah, the, the, the electron fractions of the sum of this stuff is ejected is 0.25. Um, that doesn't happen generically, but in these cases it does. It's a good point. That gives us a limit, which we have in the paper, on the rate with which these things can happen. Anyway, it's an interesting thing to calculate. We could do it. We did it. Okay. There's, an, uh, again, an interesting possible mechanism, which nobody else is getting and they don't like. But this is what we get uh, if we calculate for long enough, and we're the only group that can actually simulate this, because they, they suppress the inner motion of the core. As I said, they do the inside in 1D. And the reason this is suppressing this effect is that what we're seeing is if you wait long enough, and you have to wait for 500 milliseconds to 1,000 milliseconds, a second. That's a long time in this game. I hope you uh, registered. Um, you have to wait that long to, to get the inner core to oscillate. And it doesn't oscillate spherically. It oscillates in an L equals 1 mode. And it's a G mode. It's not a P mode for the stellar pulsation and uh, astro-seismology people. That mode unambiguously is excited. It unambiguously exists. The question is what the amplitude is. There's this nice paper by uh, Weinberg and Quadert that suggests that when the mode gets to high amplitudes, that it actually, by parametric amplification, well, uh, parametric resonance actually splits into daughter modes that dissipate and don't give you what we're seeing, which is if that doesn't happen, and that would happen on very small sc scales, we can't resolve yet. Um, that these oscillations drive sound waves down the density gradient, and those sound waves become shock waves, and those shock waves deposit energy and cause it to explode. The energy of the explosion is fairly low, but if it happens for about a few seconds, then you can get up to about 10 to 51 ergs, according to our calculation. We can't calculate that long. But let me show you what happens if some of this is, makes any sense at all. First, this is the inner oscillation. This is uh, 50 kilometers. This is uh, colored by density. Nothing much is happening, but watch eventually. Unfortunately, this takes a little time, but watch the inner region. What's going to happen is that inner region is going to move in this direction. The outer region is going to move in this direction. The center of mass stays the same, and it oscillates like this. And that's a G mode, very high amplitude tsunami moving over the surface. So it's uh, like waves on a rip uh, ripples on a pond but it's a self-gravitating spherical pond with tsunamis that are kilometers high. Okay. And you can get oscillations like this. This does happen. And you, as you can see, you have to do this multi-D. You can't do this in 1D. This, this is the and, same. And, yeah. and so the quateric claim is that um, that, that uh, single mode is coupling to higher, of course it will and that somehow you're missing it? Now, why would you be missing it? Is it because... Because the wavelengths are too small. 
3D? No, the wavelengths are too small for us to resolve. We're off by Wait, a factor of five. I thought that the cascade. The modes he's talking, they're talking about are really small. So they're dealing with a large Analytic. scale mode going immediately to really short distance. When it gets That's the, not the way instabilities usually go, is it? Well, when you get up to high enough nonlinear amplitudes, then it's possible that you can spawn daughter modes. And they, they're spawning a, a number of daughter modes. Some of those daughter modes have really short wavelengths that are going to dissipate by neutrino losses. And so you, you basically, if you convert into these modes and they dissipate without giving you the hydrodynamic effect, then that's bad for this. So putting it another way, is the picture that all of this uh, little perturbations on the... Uh, on no, the, uh, I'm going to have to explain. The I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain if I could, yeah. So you get these oscillations. This, this is the strong standing accretion shock instability. It gives you shock kinks. It gives you accretion streams that hit the surface. Those accretion streams um, cause these tsunamis over the surface. They're supersonic. So as you oscillate the surface, it can't send the energy back up. So it's irreversible. This is going to do this again uh, very quickly. Well, as quickly as I can go. Look at the clock down here. This is 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. This is going to go to many hundreds of milliseconds. You see the shock stalled bad. You get convection here. Then the thing starts to become globally unstable. That's the so-called SASE. This is a combination of neutrino and just intrinsic instability of a standing accretion shock. But it's going to get so violent that you get shock kinks in the shock structure. And at those kinks, you get accretion. So you get very anisotropic accretion that roils the inner material. That inner material gets Mach numbers that are higher and higher and higher. The pressure field around there gets very, very, uh, get lots of turbulence in there, and that causes the oscillations. But if you have these very uh, directional streams hitting the surface, it's like having a fire hose, using a fire hose to excite waves on the surface of a lake. They'll propagate out. This is a supersonic fire hose. And so there are the fire hoses right there. And that can keep the oscillation going. And so watch what happens. You get this oscillation that is driven by these fire hoses, these downflowing plumes, and you get shock waves, sound waves that seep into shock waves coming out. The color is entropy. And those shock waves add up. And you get, and you get explosions in this direction at the same time as you get accretion in the other direction. And so what happened was you get an explosion in one direction at the same time as it's not exploding in the other. You're continuing to power it. You get simultaneous explosion and accretion, which you can't do in 1D, right? So the breaking of the symmetry to allow the explosion in one direction while maintaining the power source coming in by accretion in the other seemed to be key here. And that's what we're seeing is the key to all the viable explosion mechanisms, whether they're acoustic, neutrino, or MHD. Simultaneous accretion and explosion. The accretion continuing to bring in the energy necessary, whether it's by neutrinos, because you get gravitational energy converted into heat that's radiated, or the acoustic power, the downflowing plumes, or the, what I'm going to show a little bit in a second, the MHD, the MHD uh, mechanism, which has explosions along the poles and continued accretion along the equator that brings in the differential kinetic energy and the free energy. There's a question. So how important is the boundary No, no, this is the inner 750 kilometers. This calculation goes out to 5,000 kilometers. Uh, the, what you were seeing was bouncing. You were seeing it bounce off the plumes. So the sound waves will reflect off those plumes. They're moving supersonically, and they're also dense. And so you get this. Compl that's why we can't do it analytically so easily. You get the cavity produced in which there's sound bouncing around. And it's actually the sound pressure is large enough that it actually pushes the accretion streams backwards. And you'll see that again in the third time I'm showing this. I usually don't throw it three times. Can I ask uh, just, uh, two questions? First is you may. So in, in, in this, uh, it's still 2 and a half d right? So uh, this is 2D. Core, this is 2D. Two, okay, so most of the core is just along the z-axis. Right. Okay, that's why we see things go up and down. That's right, that's right. In 3D, who knows? And and rotation may set a scale. Right. Uh, scale okay. axis. And, and, and the, the, the other question is, what is the, the time scale that you have the fire hoses big in the star compared to... 
the period of the jivas? Are they similar or very different? Ah, let me, I'll get to that in a second. But I just want to emphasize again. So you have these plumes coming in, hitting the surface. Those plumes could be steady and still excite the G mode, which in this calculation has 330 hertz uh, oscillation. And that's been confusing people. Let me just say again. Again, you have sound waves coming out and creating a cavity here and accretion on the other side. Now, if you have steady accretion, you ask the question, where's the periodicity? that will resonate with the inner core. You don't need one. Because what you're doing, it's spatial as well as temporal. The stream that's coming in has a width. That width has a wavelength. That wavelength with a dispersion relation for G modes on the surface gives you the frequency distribution. That frequency distribution overlaps with the modes. It's not that the frequency distribution of the stuff that uh, uh, the, pr the pressure f fluctuations around the surface is what's crucial. That does occur, and you do get some sort of resonance there, and the, and the, and the frequencies of that stuff, convection on the outside, are low, and you're looking at only the tail to get the 350 hertz, because those frequencies are about 50 hertz. But if you have just a steady stream, then you get from the width of the stream wavelengths, the wavelength spectrum, that then gives you the frequency spectrum you need. And because the stream is supersonic, you can't get the oscillations to work, do work back on the exciter as you can with a sprint, a, a swing. The person in the swing can get, do work on the, on the thing that's pushing it. You can't do that here if it's supersonic. It's pretty subtle. I'm not sure I, I understand that. It, it, it's true if I had a rubber ball and I, and I whacked it with a hammer. Okay, and it was an instantaneous impulse. The size of the hammer will, in, in, will, will set the dominant mode of sight even though it was an instantaneous impulse. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if I have a rubber ball and I bring the hammer down with my two-ton press and I don't move it anymore, my ball deforms and I can expand that in modes however I want, but then it doesn't start off. Awesome. That's kind of what's happening here. So uh, there's got to be more to it. Well, no, no. Well, let's do it after. Yes. Uh, okay. No. This is an important point. So. Here's the radius uh, vers uh, on the top and the bottom, just the uh, north and south poles versus time. 0.2 seconds, 0.4 seconds, 0.6 seconds. Standard calculation is just watch the shock. There, there's a discontinuity. The color is indicating the entropy. There's the shock. It goes up to 200 kilometers or something. And people, when the shock started to decrease in radius, sort of gave up. But you can see it started to oscillate. This is the standing accretion shock instability. And this oscillation generates the turbulence in the inner regions, which in this calculation, after a long period of time, excited these inner modes, which exploded in one direction and not another. So we got a unipolar explosion. Yes? So uh, do you know what the reason is for that time delay between the, you know, the large amplitudes and then the oscillation of the star? The, the, this time delay seems to be connected with the perturbation spectrum in the initial state. Okay. This time delay... It's hard to say because this one, this one was the shortest we ever had. Most of them were about a second or 0.8 seconds. And so I, it just takes a long time. The major thing is that eventually you're going to get oscillations. Um, if the amplitudes are large enough, you're starting to generate a fair amount of power, but you also have to have a low accretion rate so you can overcome that easily and you have to wait for that to happen. There's also some characteristic frequency of oscillations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fundamental GMO. You can do that analytically. The analytic result conforms to the hydro result. The only thing we don't know is amplitude from first principles. Yeah, since I was interrupted a lot, perhaps. Okay. Um, so this is the, the, the same sort of calculation to give you a better sense of things uh, so in pseudo 3D. It's a 2D calculation that's been rotated. So here's a standing, stalled accretion shock. Color is entropy. You're going to see the sassy inside. There's a little defect along the pole due to, to the, um, the differencing in this calculation. We've actually fixed this, but this is the movie I have. You can see this type of oscillation. These are the shells collapsing in. It's trying to explode. It's trying in, to go in various directions. But the neutrino mechanism wasn't adequate in this case to do it. But it became so vigorous in the inside here, and again, these plumes hitting the surface, that you've got this type of an oscillation. See the topological defects? 
And this oscillation was enough because it's an oscillation that has p-mode characters, a g-mode of p-mode characters, a complex oscillation. And further out, you have, it's basically acoustic. Now, the power of the um, oscillation is small. But the efficiency for the deposition of energy by acoustic means is large. In the neutrino case, the neutrino power is much larger. But the efficiency for the deposition of neutrino energy is small. When you take the product of the power and the efficiency in those two cases, in the early stages, the neutrino should dominate. If they don't succeed, you can check to see whether the acoustic dominates, if this is actually correct. And then they cross over. The product crosses over. And so you produce an asymmetrical explosion, which brings in, continues to bring in power from the, the backside as it's exploding here. Then it explodes in all directions. But this breaking of symmetry was rather crucial. Because if you explode spherically, this is a key point. If you're a neutrino mechanism, for example, if you explode spherically and accretion is an important component of the luminosity, you're reversing the accretion. So you're turning off the luminosity just when you need it. If you explode in one direction while maintaining accretion in the other, then as you're exploding, you're maintaining the source just when you need it. And so that breaking of symmetry, again, I've emphasized this a lot, and the simultaneous accretion and explosion seems to be a key to getting the thing going, started, and keeping it going. And here's that crossover I referred to, neutrinos and the acoustic case. So it's hard to estimate the acoustic. <coughs> Question? Um, well, maybe you'll get to that, but seems to be a good mechanism to produce a kick, a kick from the, uh, the supernova. Yeah. So can you sort of estimate what sort of... Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get to that if I have some time. So this is the same sort of collapse with rapid rotation and magnetic fields. I just wanted to show some effects of magnetic fields, changing gears a little bit. If it's rotating fast enough, then you can get wind-up of the field. There should be a significant MRI in here. We've under-resolved the magnetic rotational instability, which should obtain in here. But you get collapse, bounce. This has the full neutrinos on. But it has MHD in the way I described, 2.5D. The magnetic fields amplify up. And along the uh, poles, you get these magnetic towers that when the stress is large enough, that's a, above the accretion ram, you just get explosions. It naturally emerges. And you get an explosion on the pole while you're still accreting along the equator. Accreting along the equator brings in the differential kinetic energy, which is the source of energy for the magnetic fields that are then continually created and pushed along the pole. Again, simultaneous accretion and explosion. And these are many field structures you get where we just put in a couple of field lines. The color is entropy. There's where the shock wave is, in fact. It's a very cone shape. And you can see the magnetic fields. Different models give different degrees of winding but the same basic effect. You get this bipolar tunnel boring machine. Okay, And this is a movie of that. Where again, we, we could have put more lines in here, but then you couldn't have seen anything. There's the stalled shock. There's the clock. But the stress of the fields got large enough, eventually, this is after 200 milliseconds, that you start, you just get a bipolar explosion. This is a, perhaps a mechanism for hypernovae because there's a lot of, if it's rotating fast, there's a lot of kinetic energy in the differential motion. And you can get 10 to 52 ergs, maybe not much more than that but about 10 to 52 ergs pretty straightforwardly. That's 10 times more than we expect for supernovae. This is the explosion power, this is the Bernoulli flux. That's just the Bernoulli integral integrated and pointing flux. We can separate them out. You can see the different numbers. For one, these general, generally in these models, what happens versus time is that you saturate and you have a steady state engine as long as you're accreting. And so if you have rapid rotation and you didn't explode by another mechanism, uh, like the uh, neutrino mechanism, these things quickly get up to very high powers, 10 to 52 ergs, for example, per second. We, we, and this may be hypernova. There's a lot of questions with the uh, MHD stuff. We haven't resolved the magnetic rotational instability people have identified as the important ingredient in the viscosity of accretion disks. But in this spherical case, people have also shown, and we've shown this as well, that the, this instability should lead to growth of uh, magnetic field on rotational time scales. And so on millisecond time scales, if it's rotating fast enough, you can get significant energy in the magnetic fields. We don't think this happens generically. We don't see pulsars that are rotating fast enough. Okay. So this just summarizes the neutrino mechanism. You have uh, this, this sassy instability. 
the instabilities and this convective motion, perhaps in 3D, naturally leads to explosions. Well, it should naturally lead to explosions. We will see. It will explode more in one direction than another. When it explodes in that direction, it will continue to accrete along the direction it's not exploding for a while. That accretion just brings in gravitational energy, hits the surface, heats it up, radiates neutrinos. Those neutrinos are much more isotropic than the matter. And so you keep the engine going. The MHD, same thing, as I said. You accrete along the, the equator while you explode along the poles, the acoustic mechanism, as I described. So all the mechanisms benefit from this breaking of symmetry and, and having a partial explosion in the early stages. Now, neutrino bursts, I want to round up. Uh, neutrino bursts are an important component of all this. We did see the neutrino bursts from 87A. The type of uh, signal you get from a uh, uh, spectrum signal might look like this, or this, the red curve is the electron neutrinos. This is just details for those uh, who are interested in the details. And these other species come up. There are specific predictions for what this will look like. We calculate these things. It's going to be different for different angles. But we've also calculated multi-D. So this is an indication. Uh, this is a map, a movie, of the flux distribution of one group of uh, electron neutrinos. And the vectors are fluxes. And so that gives you a sense of um, the multi-D transport. I want to show two things. The vectors are dancing around because we can do the multi-D transport. Um, this is actually 4 pi r squared times the flux, so the ve vectors are about the same length at large distances. They would otherwise decrease as a flux. But I want you to see, look at the, look at the material in the background. The material in the background is undergoing the SASE oscillation. It's vigorously asymmetrical. The radiation field is pretty symmetrical. Because again, radiation is an interval. Now, uh, just as Dick wanted, this is a, just, this is a map of the, basically the neutrino spheres for the rapidly rotating case. These vectors are flux vectors coming from a very oblate rapidly rotating object. Flux is coming out much more along the poles than the equator. The colors are isodensity. These are densities. Basically, the interfaces are isodensity contours. So these are very oblate when they're rotating fairly rapidly. And you get very asymmetrical neutrino emissions. Um, now, kicks have been mentioned. This is a natural context for kicks. Without any sp fancy physics, no particle physics, uh, no special particle physics necessary, no very high magnetic fields. What you get naturally in a lot of these explosions is asymmetrical explosions. And so the thing left behind is going to recoil. Not only that, and that's what this diagram shows. It may not be obvious, but just listen to my words. You can do the multi-angle transport. And you can see in the direction of explosion what the difference is between the fluxes uh, uh, in the direction of explosion and the anti-direction of the explosion. And what we can show is, in fact, that in the direction of explosion, you can see deeper in. The neutrino sphere is further in. And so it's a hotter neutrino sphere. You're seeing it at higher temperatures. And you get a larger flux in that direction. So you explode in that direction. You recoil in this direction due to the mass motion. You give up more neutrinos in that direction. And you recoil in the same direction due to the neutrinos. If you integrate the neutrino losses over the entire neutrino emission time, and it stays more or less in the same direction, which is really problematic, but it's possible that it, on average it would, then if you have 1% asymmetry in the neutrino losses, you get 300 per, uh, kilometer per second kicks. The matter motions that we see here, we haven't published this because I'm, I'm, after doing all these calculations at late times, it's very hard to go far enough. But when these explosions occur, you get recoils. We've gotten up to 150 kilometers per second just due to the matter motions. And that's the end of the calculation. It's very expensive to do this. Each one of these simulations took a number of months on the supercomputers. And we've done 50 or 60 of these things. And so it's a daunting question. But this is what we're aiming for. So things like the Guattari Nebula, where we have a neutron star that is moving, leaving behind a nebula, a ram pressure confined nebula. Um, that, and this thing is moving at about 1,500 kilometers per second. We can say a lot more about the R process. I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff. Uh, in the acoustic mechanism, we get to such high entropies that it's possible, in fact, to get an R process, but we don't reproduce the R process in detail. 
And uh, it's been very hard to find a site for the R process. So I'm going to leave that open, an open question. But there's still the possibility that there are contexts in which you can get the R process. There's also uh, gravitational radiation. That's a whole topic in itself. I'm going to skip through this very quickly. But if you have asymmetrical motions, then you have time-changing quadrupole moments. Each one of these phases, convection, the SASE, the G mode, has a distinct signature. The SASE for uh, the G mode oscillation, that's almost a pure tone. That's a pure tone with a frequency distribution that looks like this. That's a prediction. Could easily be wrong, but who cares? This is in the literature now. <laughs> so the, you, G, the gravitational waves can, in principle, with neutrinos, can, in principle, give you internal diagnostics, but it's going to be hard to, to get these data. And uh, meanwhile, we soldier on. What we're trying to do now is 3D. 3D will allow us to do not only rotation, but uh, test that uh, 1D, 2D, 3D hierarchy for the neutrino mechanism. This is an example of a 3D simulation um, that, by Ott et al., which also includes GR, general relativity, which we didn't include in the previous calculations. Those are Newtonian simulations. You can get very interesting structures, but my only point in showing this is we're on the threshold of being able to do 3D. We can do the 3D hydro. It's the transport that's tough. And then integrating for a long time. It's not just getting a few uh, cycles of 3D. We have to do it almost a million times. Because the time steps are limited by the current condition, by and large, for these explicit codes, which means that the center, which isn't doing much, is determining the time steps at a microsecond. And so we need a million of them. And that introduces all sorts of, uh, of worries about the numerics. Yes? Have you seen the spiral molding? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 the, we have a whole paper on um, if it's rotating rapidly enough to get M equals one uh, arm uh, uh, instability so that you can see the T over W instability. In fact, in these contexts, you can get T over Ws of 0.1 being unstable. The secular instability is at about 0.14, and the dynamical instability is at about 0.27. T over W is kinetic energy rotation over gravitational energy, GM squared over R. And uh, it goes unstable to triaxial and other types of instabilities if it's rotating fast enough. So this is just a summary of where we're trying to go. The future is 3D, better transport, hopefully better progenitors, and a fundamental understanding. This problem is difficult because of the multidimensional nature. But it's not because of neutrinos. It's not because it's particle physics plus astrophysics plus numerics, etc., and only a few people need apply. This is just like photon transport. It's not that exotic. In fact, it's easier than photon transport, but it's multi-D. And it involves neutrinos, which a lot of astrophysicists and astronomers don't like. Go figure. But there's, uh, that's, the, that's the future. And we have some ideas and some sense of what will make these things explode. And so stay tuned in the next few years to, uh, to um, and keep track of some of the developments, because there may be some interesting things that will emerge from the, our collective work on this. And thank you very much for your patience. Okay, time for one or two questions. Oh. We can continue upstairs. No, but not collectively. How much higher resolution do you need to go to to see the one gradient? Uh, we need 100 times more CPU, because it's five in one dimension. Five in another dimension, because you, you don't want to have too many, too, uh, you want X and Y to be so different. And then uh, it'll change the current condition by a factor of five. So it's five times five times five. Five in one dim linear dimension. It's about as fast as going to 3D. Yeah. Uh, to do it over the same amount of time. Yeah. What do you Now, you're saying that um, even without the neutrino, uh, at least early stage explosion from 3D, you're guaranteed to get an explosion from the Stasi instabilities at the end of the day. No, so well, no, no, no we, we haven't demonstrated that. Um, it's, it, if it doesn't, if you didn't have these instabilities, it's, we don't see, and it stayed in 1D, spherically symmetric, we don't see how the generic thing could explode by the neutrino mechanism. Yes, but in Stasi, in your 2D Stasi, they always explode. But that's by the acoustic mechanism, the acoustic not by mechanism. the neutrino mechanism. That's right. So by the acoustic mechanism, they always explode. If that's correct, that's, yeah, they yeah. always explode. And yes. so it, even if in 3D there is no, ex no neutrino driven explosion, you still get the hydrodynamic explosion, presumably, and that would be If it. that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just other groups haven't reproduced that because they don't do the inner core right and they don't integrate out far enough. They don't uh, integrate in long enough in time. There was a paper, a very nice paper, uh, pretty nice paper by Marek and Janka that just came out um, 
the referee, which is, who isn't me, I don't know, um, has held it up for a year and a half. And uh, it was because uh, they needed to simulate for longer than they did. They, 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 they started to see the onset of explosion and then they declared victory. The referee wanted them to calculate further. Well, it turned out that onset of explosion was a dud. And they had to calculate for another 300, 400 milliseconds. And in their code, the time steps are even shorter than ours because of some of the things that they want to do that they don't need to do. And so it took them another year and a half to simulate to 650, 700 milliseconds. And so it's uh, computationally demanding. Okay, I suggest to uh, stop here, continue upstairs. Okay, so let's thank that again.